We have learned from John A. Powell that belonging is both subjective and objective. To us, this means that in order to advance belonging, we must engage in actions that help more people to more regularly access this feeling of belonging through transforming the structures we work within and are connected to. We acknowledge that the conditions for individual belonging may vary from person to person, requiring us to listen to others, to incorporate their ideas, and to ultimately develop strategies that meet the needs for a wide range of people. While the experience of belonging is subjective, there are objective conditions, processes, policies, and structures that can be changed to increase access to belonging. Welcome everyone to another episode of When We Belong. I'm excited to be with my colleagues once again. And we have an exciting bit of information we wanna share with you all because as we've been talking about the scope of belonging, we also wanted to bring to y'all some of the ways that state government is ushering in belonging now. Uh, some of this was obviously done before belonging really was a thing, but I'm excited because my colleagues here are gonna be sharing their personal experience with some of these pathways to belonging that exist today. And later on, we're going to be sharing some of the things that we are really looking to implement for the future when it comes to embedding belonging in Washington state government. So with that, of course, I'm Trey Holiday, Trayana Holiday, the communications director for the Office of Equity. Happy to be with you all. I'm going to pass this intro over to Makayla. Thanks, Trey. So hi, everyone. Nice to see you all again, or nice to meet you if this is your first time. Uh, Michaela Dolman, I use she, her, and they, them pronouns, and I lead state HR within the Office of Financial Management. And I will pass it over to Mykia. Hello, hello, everyone. I am Mykia Guy, she, her pronouns, and I am the Director of Equity and Grants at Serve Washington. It's a pleasure to be here. And I will pass it to Megan. Hi everyone, Megan Matthews here. My pronouns are she and her, and I'm the director of the Washington State Office of Equity. Well, welcome all of y'all. So happy to be with y'all today. As you can see, it's like a M party and then I'm the random <laughs> T in this whole thing, but that's all right, that's all right. My middle name is Monique, so I'm with y'all. Um, Anyway, <laughs> yeah, uh, but I really wanted to hear from you all today about some of the ways that you've been experiencing belonging. I know we've talked about maybe just kind of generalistically speaking, uh, the BRGs, the ERGs, and then the EAP, right? Like, so we have all these acronyms, but really it's about business resource groups, employee resource groups, and the employee assistance program that kind of together have really been doing some of this work around belonging. I want to start with you. Makayla, because you were talking a bit about uh, the, the BRGs and just some some exciting news. But ultimately, it's it's that these are the spaces that a lot of employees have been finding belonging. And you, from an HR perspective, have been able to understand that through the employee engagement surveys and some of the ways that people have really clung to uh, the cultural benefits that come from some of these BRGs. Tell us more. Yeah, and if it's okay, I'll just like set up some context because I know that we try to do as much as we can to share about the business resource groups, but I know that you know if you happen to work in a field office out in a, a remote part of the state, you might not be aware of it because one of the things that we're recognizing is that you know communication is not accessible to everyone, and you know some of so much of it depends on do you have a supervisor and do you have an organization that is sharing this information out with you, um, so. For context, if you have not yet heard of the bus of business resource groups, uh, the Office of Financial Management, our team sponsors them and that we provide support, but they're really kind of uh, fun, fun, created and run at the ground level where it's any group that kind of identifies, says, hey, we belong to right now. What it is, is if you belong to a protected class, you can say, we want to create a business resource group and you and we're looking at that definition or expanding it. So I'll put that out there right now. But that's been historically where we're at, where um, folks have come together that said, you know, why don't we have a business resource group for black and African-Americans? Let's come together, put together a charter um, and say this is what we want. And then 
make it accessible to anyone in, in the state who wants to attend. And so we currently have eight business resource groups. Uh, one, Our first one that was created was for our veteran employees, and then we built it out. Our, mo our um, most recent business resource group that's been created is for Hawaiian, Asian, or Hawaiians, Asians, and Pacific Islanders. We call it HAPPEN. Um, and it's really kind of a place where people can come to say, I want to talk about this aspect of my identity and I want to find people who either look like me who or who share my culture or who see me and want to support me as an ally. Um, I can say that I've participated in all of the business resource groups at some point, whether it's just attending a meeting as an ally or because I identify as part of that business resource group. Um, but I think what was so compelling is we recently had a public performance review that Results Washington puts on with the governor and we had uh, leaders and members from many of the business resource groups sharing their experience. And each one kind of shared a story of a time where it said, you know, I didn't feel like I belonged in my workplace. As the state of Washington, no matter what we're doing, my experience was that I didn't feel like I belong. But because of these business resources resource groups and because we had the space, I found a place where I could belong. And that's what's kept me here. That's what's kept me here, uh, despite the, the workplace culture that I've experienced. And it's both a place of belonging, but it's also that idea of like, it takes so many of our hands to make the change in state culture. So the more people that we can say who can, who identify, this is a place that overall I don't belong, but by staying here, I'm willing to contribute to belonging and changing the culture for others. Like just how powerful is that, that we can use these spaces, not only to create a safe space or a comfortable space for folks, but also that that kind of cascades out to what we can do across state government in all of the different workplaces outside of the BRG space. Yeah, this is uh, so important. And I, you know, for me still being new, I have yet to really dive in, but I did get to experience uh, build when they put on the Juneteenth celebration uh, earlier this year. And so that was great to be able to see that. Uh, Mykia, when it, when it comes to this kind of conversation, how have you been able to experience these pathways of belonging that already exist in state government? Oh my goodness, Trey. I have to tell you, um, what Mykia said is, is by giving that context, it kind of had me thinking back on some things that I'm a transplant to Washington, right? I came to Washington from North Carolina. And so that's a bit of a culture shock coming into this space. And when I got here, um, I worked for a smaller agency that, you know, didn't really have um, the diversity I'm used to seeing that I had become accustomed to seeing. And so, and what I noticed is in this huge building we were in, because this is before remote work, that there were a few agencies in there and there still were not, you know, any, any people who looked like me. And I was discouraged and I was nervous and I was sad and imposter syndrome really beats you up for real. You know, when you're in these spaces and I was worried about the stability of my position and why am I here? And, you know, what are people thinking about me in this meeting? And, and you know, things like that. Um, and it got to the point where I was like, well, maybe, maybe I'll go back to nonprofit work, right? Like I, I, I can leave state government because I don't think that state government wants me because I don't see me here. I don't see anything for me to, that I can aspire to here. I don't see a path for growth here because I'm not seeing anyone else grow in that way. And I had a colleague come across the hall um, and she, she rushed in there and she was like, I've been looking for you. I heard that you were in here and I've been looking for you. And um, it was it was what I needed. And, and she hugged me, didn't know my name yet. And she hugged me. And at that time, Build was just getting started. They were still in their planning process and she was telling me about it. And she invited me to like this lunch where there were so many amazing, just ambitious, sweet, compassionate black people were there. And they were all, you know, engaged in, in the build thing. I didn't know what build was, but they were in the thing. Um, no, I'm sorry. At that time, it was called the Black Business Resource Group. It was just the Black BRG, <laughs> right? And it like soothed me because I was like oh so we're there we're here we in here um where are we at though right and I was able to see and all over the state in so many different agencies and so many different you know industries and positions and you know just different levels and different um you know subject matter experts and I was like oh okay so 
if I can, if I can, you know, stay here, if I can see this, if I, if I know that I have this to come to, um, actually that's where I met Megan for the first time. And when Megan was talking about, because Megan, you know, was involved in the, the founding of build, um, what she said that she loved about the meetings, Megan, I don't know if you remember this is you said, I can go here and I can laugh with my whole body. And I was like, that's what I want to do. I want to be able to laugh with my whole body. Um, and so, you know, I got involved and I've been in actively involved since then um, as a policy and data co-lead. And right now I lead the outreach. Um, and had it not been for BUILD through the different agencies that I've kind of traveled through because you're trying to find your niche, you know, trying to find your space, there have been toxic work situations. And I'm like, I, I can't do it. I can't do it. But you know what? I have a network that I can call on, that I can reach out to. Um, when I'm worried about how I'm going to feel um, worthy of some of these positions that I want to apply to, I have people who are like, you probably should work on your public speaking. And so let me introduce you to this person and let me give you this opportunity and let me have you do this. And oh, do you know this person over here? And so through that, I, I would not be where I am in state government right now were it not for build and the networking and the support and the, I don't like to say family at work because that can be toxic too, but it is, it's community and it's family and it's a soft place to land. Um, it's a place where, you know, I don't have to have the respectability politics. I don't have to, you know, straighten up. I mean, I can shake my locks and, you know, it's not like a national event, you know, oh, look what's happening. Like it's, it's 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 a it's a sense of community that I didn't realize that I needed because I was used to seeing it where I was from. But when I got here and it was missing, it was not to be dramatic, but it was a hole. And it was like I don't belong here because I don't see me here. I don't see where my children could be here. This ain't for me. And if it wasn't for and and I'll say her name, Miss Angie Adams. And if it weren't for Miss Angie Adams coming across that hall and grabbing me. And showing me like you belong here and here are your people. Here are the people who will stand you up. There are people that I have cried to, people that I, who have called me, I'm like, let's just go get lunch because you didn't look like you were doing well in that last meeting. Like that's, that's you know, what you need. And um, through the different, you know, agencies and, and getting to know people, were it not for build, had I not had, like I said, that soft place to land, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have stayed in state government. Yeah. Mm. Look, Makala, you is uh you brought me back. <laughs> it's been so long since we had those planning meetings. Makala was there. Makala was one of the planners for Build. And I oh my gosh, you know, when you're talking about like toxic workplaces and things like that. I remember these meetings were every week for like an hour or two every week. I can't remember how long, but you know, in the afternoon. Now, you know that when you have afternoon meetings, you're like, oh yeah, dang, like I'm so tired. And we were all looking forward to these meetings. We couldn't wait to be there. We were so excited and we would be in there clowning. Like we would be laughing so hard and so loud. If you was late, you come into these meetings, you hear things coming down the hall. We was in DOH, you hear it's coming down the hall. We were having such a good time. And we were working hard. So like, that's what I think people don't always put together, that it can look like we're not doing nothing and we're doing a lot. Uh, and just to put it in context, we started, I think our first meetings for planning build and launching build, that means doing the whole charter. So creating the whole charter and our kickoff event at the same time. We, uh, our first meeting was in June, our kickoff event was in October. And then COVID hit and George Floyd was murdered that next March. I mean, bam, right? Like had, and you know, I remember, I think it was uh, Lonnie. I think it was Lonnie Spikes the, uh, with the Fish and Wildlife now. Lonnie talking about, we got to get this done. We got to get this done. I was like, why Lonnie? We just got to get it done. It's almost like he knew or something. I don't know. But he was like rushing us. He'd come in there halfway through the meeting. Are y'all done yet? We'd be like, Lonnie, you know, and then bam, right? So we people were like, are they even working in there? We were working hard. We were working hard. But it was also like a space where I could just be me. I'm loud. Okay, y'all know this. I am loud. Everything about me is loud. If I'm quiet, you should be concerned, right? I'm loud. I laugh loud. Uh, 
I, I like to clown. I like to joke. And so many of the things that are about my natural state uh, are not helpful in my own career trajectory, right? These are things that are not uh, appreciated often in the workspaces. Uh, and so, you know, you, you know, people, you know, we come to work and what's the quote unquote professional, which I hate that term, but what is it, what is acceptable at work? And that's usually a set of conditions that are not created by us. Right. And so, but you have to learn them if you're going to be successful. And at this space, it was a space where I could just be me. And, and I, and I wouldn't have to worry about how it was taken because we would be in there clowning each other. I mean, clowning. And like, but it was love. It was love. And we didn't, I didn't know none of these people. I didn't know it's one person I think I knew. Ayana is the one who introduced me to it. And uh and um, but it was like love. You sat, we sat down and it took, you know, you're a little okay, we're not sure, like, is this a space that's cool or not? We always have to like peep it out a little bit. Boy, it maybe took 15 minutes and it was over. That was it. Um, and so, you know, but we worked how we got it launched, and um, and that was like I was like, oh my gosh, I feel in community. And then you start seeing, you know, we host events and start seeing things and and everyone else comes out, right? And everybody came out and brought their brilliance and their beautifulness. And then we we linked up with the other beards. We, we had been like, we we really needed their help to get launched so quickly. And they did, and we appreciated that support. And, um, and then it was learning about their communities. I had never heard of a BRG until, you know, um, uh, Ayana said, hey, you want to come help us plan build? And, or it wasn't, right? It wasn't built at the time. You wanted a BRG for the Black community. And I was like, what? <laughs> but, you know, then you get connected to other communities and then you start to see the similarities and then you start to grow, right? And you're on awareness of how the system's bringing us in and kicking us out and spinning us out and the invisibility that people feel and the ways that the system protects itself. You know, we think about data and we're having these conversations. I'm just talking now. Y'all have to shut me up a little bit. But we think about like with data, we think about how the standard is that if the, the sample size isn't large enough, we just put NA as if the whole community is not applicable, right? Like, and, and you know, we're having a conversation now about like, well, is it just that your data collection, collection uh, methods aren't satisfactory enough to actually count the people who are in this demographic because the people is not an insignificant number, right? It's not an insignificant number. And um, and so like coming together around like these, these topics that really impact us all and really coming together to uh, uh, put our power, our collective power together to really advocate for ourselves. And, you know, we were able to do some incredible things. And so like, I take those lessons with me because even we think on a broader scale in the groups, we've got groups who are advocating for um, other uh, systemic, systematically excluded populations, right? And and the the being in a white supremacist culture where we say, you got to fight for your own and screw everybody else. Like we can't succumb to that. We have to come together, right? And first you have to feel safe in your own community, but then you come together and you advocate with other communities, not thinking that I have to get mine and, and you know, you got to get your own, but like we can get, we are, we can get our, all of ours together. Okay, I'm gonna stop talking now. It's enough for me. No, but I think you made some valid points here because I mean, we're talking about the creation of safe spaces, right? I mean, we're really talking about places where, and, and the, the funny thing is, is that, the need for these spaces is so vast, right? Like, I mean, you y'all were just talking about people willing to leave their job if they didn't have these spaces. So the need for them is so serious and it's embed so much because you don't always get to express yourself in your full cultural regalia when you're on your role, right? When you're just in your job. So the need for these spaces is really essential. I think when we talk about how belonging exists in space, right? And some of that means that we need to have these very specific um, identity groups that allow us to really dig deeper into areas of our identity that really then connect with others who are there because we have a shared identity set that we're bringing together, right? And so um, when you talked about family, right? Like family on the job, I mean, yeah, like that's, 
that's essentially what you want to feel because you're with these people uh, sometimes more than family, right? And so it's uh, it's necessary when we think about some of the aspects of belonging, you know, the, the feeling that I get to come to work and know that like, hey, yo, Megan is my director, but I can still go to Megan and be like, girl, wait, today, let me just take the veil off a little bit. You need that, right? You really need that. Um, when, we, when we think about the ways that, and these groups kind of form organically, but then provide these opportunities to folks. I'd love to hear from, from you all's perspective as you're like in the moment with the BRG and you're there and you're experiencing this, like what are some of those key takeaways for you that you have felt like, wait a minute, this is this is belonging for me. Go ahead, Mikea. Um, I want to say, so so many things. But the first thing I want to say is when you're talking about creating those safe spaces, right? And so we have safe spaces and then we have brave spaces, right? And and the difference in being in a safe space is I don't have to be brave. I don't have to be brave. I can be weepy, vulnerable, ragey, all of that. And it's all okay. But and and then there's an, a necessity for brave spaces where like here I'm gonna be vulnerable and this hasn't traditionally been safe for me, but I think that it's going to help with us being able to move forward. And when you're in a um a situation where you're the only or one of few, you find yourself in a whole lot of brave spaces, which are taxing and they're painful. Um, and then when you get to your safe space, you have nothing to give. And, and you don't always have to have something to give, but sometimes you want to be able to pour into someone else, right? Like you pour, when I pour out of my cup, I'm pouring out of my overflow. What's in my cup is for me. The overflow is what I give to everyone else. But if I ain't got that, then, you know, I'm just empty, right? And so one of the takeaways is I realize in that safe space, brave space, I can be in a safe space in other BRGs. When I'm with LLN, I'm in a safe space. You know, when I'm talking to Dan, I'm in a safe space um, because we're all able to, as Megan was saying, to kind of collaborate. And Makayla was saying, you know, on on our unique experiences and how they've impacted us and in situations where we've been erased or someone else has been erased. One of the takeaways that I had recently as I was preparing for a presentation was understanding like I know the, the need for disaggregation of data for the black community. I got that down, right? What I didn't realize was how much it was impacting the um, Asian Pacific Islander um, community, right? And I had someone from Hatton say, you know, there's over 60 different, you know, ethnicities and groups. And when they lump us together like this, it's it's like we, we're choosing an area that's so broad, we're not seeing it all, you know? And I, and I knew what it looked like for the indigenous community, right? Like I got that down. What I didn't realize is that um, for the state of Washington specifically, we only count Hispanic. We don't count Latino. And that's not the same thing. But guess what? I didn't even realize that wasn't the same thing until I got into these conversations. And so it's so much of me like, man, I knew that this was, and I know it was a struggle in general, but the specifics. And so now, brother, sister, we can really get together and talk about this and lean on each other and understand what that's like and understanding areas where I was, you know, being privileged by ableism, right? Not that I didn't advocate for, you know, disability inclusion at work and in that community or what have you, but how it just, it wasn't at the top of my mind or what have you, because I didn't, and I, because I didn't know enough about it, right? I know enough to advocate, but I didn't know enough about it. And that's a privilege to not know enough about someone else's struggle and to be able to sit with that and realize there's some changes that I need to make. There's some more research, some more learning that I need to do. And again, had it not for being in these communities with these individuals, because we all feel like we're safe and we can say it and we can give it. And, and that makes our work much more impactful. And so to wrap all that up, the takeaway is that being in these spaces and in these communities, um, are part of our internal work. They're part of our heart work. They're part of us understanding each other more fully so that we can really um, take our community beyond service level. Like I love my people, I love black people, but guess what? I'm loving everybody else too, because now I know you and I feel you and I know that you feel me the same. And that's so powerful. Yeah, you're, Go ahead. Mikhail. When you're like everything you said, Mike here, I was like, oh that, and that, and that. But it's like when, like, as you were sharing about that, the quote that comes to mind is Maya Angelou, like when we know better, we do better. 
And it's that idea of like, it's the same experience for me, like that happen and win are my two business resource groups that I like belong to. And it was so nice to have places where I could see people who looked like me. And my experience is, is somewhat different in the sense of like being mixed race. I don't like fully belong to them either. And we've, we've had those discussions of what that means uh, within those groups. But like I started in state government in 2007. So business resource groups didn't exist there. And I know that I would have left state government had I not been in a team where very thankfully all of us were, <laughs> I don't know why, like my, I don't know what my boss was doing, but every single one of us were, were Asian, Native Hawaiian or Pacific Islander. So we had our own kind of like tiny business resource group within this totally toxic environment in this larger team. And I am still like, it is that thing. Like I was a maid of honor in one of those persons wedding. Like people still ask about like, oh, Alvina, Rafia and Makayla. Like they lump us together because they, that's how close we were, you know, almost 17 years ago that people still know us as that trio because of how much we had to bond, like trauma bonding type of thing, because it was us against this whole group that didn't want us there and that we're trying to find ways, ways to kick us out. But I think about what I've learned from other business groups and like what you were sharing, my key of like, I had no idea just kind of, I think like theoretically, I understood about the struggle of like being black in America, but I didn't really understand it until I could be in community with you all and learn through build. Um, and then it gives me that opportunity to say, okay, how do I use my platform? How do I use my light skin privilege to be better now that I know this? Um, I think it's also like the part that like really resonated for me was that we brought in to happen, you know, a lot of, I was part of the business or the planning group for happen as well. And we kept saying like, we know that as Asians, historically, many of us have been taught to assimilate, to be a part of this group. How do we learn from what the black community has done with regards to like paving the road for liberation for all of us? And how do we partner with them rather than using our light skin privilege or our ability to assimilate of being that model minority? Like, how, and so it's like, it's, we use that as a call to action in part of our business resource group planning because we, we were learning from each other. And same, like the the idea of like how much ableism is still rooted in in how I speak and how I show up and like how I plan meetings. Um, I'm still learning on all of that. And I think the last thing that like really resonated with me as you were talking was kind of that mindset, like I'll I'll share in at the ripe age of 32, I got shingles because I thought I had to be perfect. Like every day I was showing up and I was like, I can't afford to fail. I need, and, and at that point in time, I was, I was a newly HR like director in a small agency. I was the only in my group, like nobody else looked like me. And I felt so isolated in this need to be perfect. Um, and how much stress that put on me. And it's that realization of how much I was missing community. And, you know, when when all of you were talking about like your experience with business resource groups, I remember like, Megan, as you were sharing about the planning committee, it was that realization of like, it was the first time where I could finally relax. Like I sat in a room and I was like, I don't have to put on this mask. I don't have to be perfect. And, you know, and that's saying something like, being like I'm not even a member of this group. And I still feel more comfortable here than I do in the everyday workplace and not needing to feel like I have to... Uh, monitor every single word that comes out of my mouth to make sure that it has purpose and that it can't be misinterpreted. And so it's like, I just, when I think about belonging, what I'm, what I'm hearing is it's just like, I can just be, I can relax and I don't have to put in all that energy to, to overanalyze what it looks like to, and how I'm showing up each day, but I can just be, and I'm in that community with folks who will be there with me. Yeah. Um, Thank, first, thank you for sharing, Michaela and Mikea, um, personal stories. You know, I think that when we share, um, it humanizes us. It humanizes us. If, you know, if we have community members who watch these, it humanizes state people for them. It also also humanizes our, our colleagues with each other. So people are humanized and I think they'll identify with our story. So I just want to thank you for what you shared because I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. We are like, okay, I can't, we're, virtually it's so hard, right? Because if we were in a community, if we were in person, we'd be having this conversation and we'd be throwing in the little anecdotes like, yeah, uh-huh, I can go ahead and say it. But you can't really do that because then nobody gets hurt virtually. So that is one of the downsides about virtual stuff. I was going to add, you know, when 
when you first mentioned safe space, Trey, it hit me. And then you brought up my key. And I was like, you know, see, so some of the things, okay, the longing, right? We talked about the longing. And I have some takeaways when we're ready to wrap the conversation up, Trey, because I know you're probably like, okay, y'all are done talking. Now y'all are really comfortable. Um, so I do have some takeaways, um, um, some expectations, some like requests that uh, leaders, colleagues in leadership positions from frontline supervisor to uh, agency head level should be doing um, to support belonging. I know that there's agency. Okay, let me, first let me do space, safe space. I, you know, it's so hard because we have, we create these spaces of communities where we can be safe and brave, where we can say whatever we want to say and do, and it feels good. But why did brave space come into being? Why do, why is there a brave space? Because safe space got weaponized. I just want to say that because I know it's not part of belonging in the conversation, but I think it's important, right? When we're talking about like, it bothers me how there are things that I use to describe the experience that we're having in spaces that we have where we talk about it should be safe for us, for people who are experiencing oppression to speak up, not safe for the person who's, who's in the dominant group or the group uh, that uh, isn't experiencing the oppression to say, I need to feel comfortable. You can't make me feel uncomfortable by, you know, talking about this system that hurts you, but now I feel uncomfortable. So, okay, I just want to say that. Let's check the box there. We can talk about that more later. Um, I want to talk about from BRGs, intersectionality. One of the things that I was really proud about Build is they started really looking at um, and doing deep dives on um, uh, Black and disability, right? We were talking about mental health and wellness, right? Like topics that we don't always talk about in our community. We also talked about Black and the LGBTQ community, right? Specifically trans and femme women um, as, as uh, I mean, super, super marginalized and, and super, super oppressed groups, right? Or systematic, systematically excluded communities who are being still murdered at the highest rates of any other uh, 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 identity group, right? And you're talking about so multiple identities that are coming together and things that we don't often like to talk about, um, but need to point out. So I really appreciate uh, like taking that front line and saying, we're going to talk about intersectional. Like, we're going to talk about that in the Black community, we're not a monolith and we are a combination of all these things. And I think to your point, Mikea and Mikaela, that when we come together, we start to see the similarities, like, oh, well, I'm a both end of this and I'm a that end of this. So how do we really, like, how do we grapple with this? So I think that that awareness is beautiful and, and it can happen where we're not being forced to have to stay at the one-on-one -on -one level of, inter of, of educating people, right? We can go deeper and start looking at the deep connections, the 400 level series, right? We're not stuck at, what is this? When you can just Google it, you know? Okay. I wanted to talk about some of the other uh, things that we're doing to um, one recruit and retain, but also to obtain or attain belonging. In the office, we're really, we're gonna start working on wellness. So I'm really having dedicated um, time and space for our own wellness because equity work is exhausting um, and it's hard work. Uh, it's relentless work, right? But we're passionate we're passionate about it. So we're going to keep doing it. So we have to pour into ourselves. We talked about the um, the state of Washington does engagement surveys. Uh, and you know, that's a way to capture kind of the pulse of what's happening with employees across the enterprise. I think we all acknowledge that we can do a better job of what do we do now that we have this information and what are questions like we talked about just now, why don't we add a question in it that says my, my supervisor, my leadership supports my uh, participation in BRGs. Right. And maybe do some kind of scale where one to five, you know, how far do you agree with this? Yes or no? I don't know. I'm just throwing it out there. Um, we did we do listening sessions. So when there's an event that happens um, and people are impacted, right? Employees are people and they're impacted by what's happening in the state and nationally. And so listening sessions, I remember during COVID and when George Floyd's murder, um, Bill hosted a number of listening sessions. I know agencies still host listening sessions today, right? So I think that's really powerful. State agencies, some have their own internal ERGs, employee resource groups, 
So I think that that's a space where employees within an agency, right? Because you have the business resource groups who are at the state enterprise level, but if agencies create and establish their own uh, employment resource groups, then you have, not only is it from the enterprise level, but you get more specific to what is the mission of your agency? What are the problems going on within your agency that you can kind of bring to the surface so you can resolve? Um, and all this is about um, getting to relationship building. Um, we're also looking at more remote work opportunities. I mean, that is the future of the workforce. Mikhail, I think I heard it from you first talking about uh, planning for the future of work. And I was like, what does that even mean? Well, we know that things are coming. So we can plan for that workspace, right? Plan for those opportunities because, you know, oftentimes where it's not like we're going to be competitive and pay with people, but if we have spaces that allow, that are more flexible, allow people to do this and the things that they love in their life, work-life balance, right? Um, that we can be more competitive. If you are an employee, if you are a, a hiring manager and you're struggling getting people into positions, you're doing something wrong. I'm just going to say that. I'm sorry. I'm going to put it out there. I'm sorry. Okay. I'm not mad at you or anything. But you're doing something wrong. We're not having any problems hiring. Our office isn't. Mikhail, you having problems hiring? Okay. So we're not. Uh, oh, I got to go get this package real fast. Sorry. Well, I think Megan brings up some really uh, phenomenal points. And even for me, you know, I'm newer to state government, but when you think about the ways that you embed yourself around people that also make you feel as though you belong. This is happening every single day. I think about the kid on the playground. It's their first time at the school. You know what I'm saying? Maybe their parents are in the military, so they travel or they you know move around a lot. But you think about people that come into a space that's already existing. There's already relationships happening and they got to find their people. Who are my friend group here? You know, um, I know for me in the private sector, uh, when you talked about the three of y'all together, uh, Makayla, that that all of y'all kind of shared an identity. Well, it was similar for me, but we were all, there was one who was from our Asian uh, community, another from the white community, and then me, uh, three women who we got together and it was through our work that we found like, okay, my work impacts yours, yours impacts this. And it was kind of like, we just started connecting and people realized on the campus, like, oh, there they go again. We became like this threesome. Um, because again, you find where you feel comfortable. And I think belonging is also a sense of comfortability. And that's something that we're talking about here in terms of, man, I just want to be able to be comfortable on my job, right? I want to not only feel like I belong, but I want the people to also respond to me being there, right? Because that's a part of it. And so the ways that you build relationship you know, in, in your job says a lot, not just about your role or the agency you're working with or the office or whatever, but when we think about state government, I love that we are being more focused and intentional on what can we be doing kind of at this level? How can we, you know, from the Office of Equity standpoint, how are we really actualizing systems change and, and ushering in belonging in a way that not only we first model it, because that's what it takes. We got to get our stuff together before we can say to any agency or consult with anybody about what they should be doing, right? And so I, I, it's so beautiful to hear Megan even talk about some of the things that we could be doing now is some of the things we're looking forward to in the future, right? Like we are already like, okay, we have someone whose job is to help us mold our culture correctly, y'all. Like that is already in and of itself, that is a new age. And that is something that hasn't really been done across a lot of governments, right? Like the idea that, no, we have someone who's like, I'm going to work on the relationships, the, the personality types. We're going to be embedding wellness, right? We're going to be doing it in a way that makes it clear to everyone within this office that this is something we're taking seriously because we're prioritizing it, right? Megan has been saying it. Look, y'all, I want you working 40 hours a week. I don't want you doing 60 hours a week. I don't want you going crazy. So we have to model it as leaders in the office, but then we get to really uh, model it for the enterprise and think about how that in and of itself is systems change because we all know a job can bring you dry okay get your every little drop out of you right I mean you were just talking about shingles because of the stress of perfection right like that's because you didn't feel like you had the room to fail and I know in black community Oftentimes, we don't feel like we have the room to fail. We are the example of all Black folk, whether we're a monolith or not, 
people don't understand that. And so you go into a job and it's like, look, I got to show up for every black person who maybe either made a mistake here. I got to rectify the mistake. I got to be the example of what it means to be a tip top employee, be up to par on all my things. I cannot make any little mistakes because unfortunately that might mean closing the door on the next black person to be up in here. And so we, we, we shoulder a lot, right? We shoulder a lot in global majority communities. And I think that there's a lot of lessons to be learned there when we think about how to dismantle that shouldering, right? So that we really can have belonging. How can you feel like, you know what? I know that if I had an off day, that's not going to be held against me until eternity, right? Like I'm going to be able to make up for that. And, and everybody's going to be able to accept what I, what I do in terms of the positivity I bring. So these kind of things are I, I think for me, y'all, sometimes when I think about belonging, I'll be honest. I think about like, what does a white person feel in terms of their privilege, right? Like they get opportunities to make mistakes. They get opportunities to grow in their mistakes, right? Like, oh, you made that mistake, but you're still eligible for this job, this other job, higher ranking job or whatever with more responsibility because you know what? We believe in you. I think about the ways that there's been this um, aura of safety around them. When we talk about it in terms of privilege, I'm always like, well, how can everyone feel that? It's a lot to dismantle to get there. But if we are intentional about every step that we're taking, we actually will see it eventually, right? And and I always, I tell my kids this, maybe not in my lifetime, you know, but I got to get the, I got to get the wheels turning now so that it's an easier wheel to turn when y'all get into position, right? Like, and I think that that gives us a real solid framework of how we're ushering in belonging, talking about the things that we have for belonging now. Uh, before we wrap, I mean, what other kind of things are y'all excited about in terms of the future, uh, in terms of positioning belonging in state government? Uh, I'll start with you, Makayla. Ooh, um, I just think about like, and like you're talking about like getting the wheel and it's that momentum, right? Like at first it's like, it's so much, pressure and so much energy that it takes to make just move the rock a tiny little bit and then the more it gets going the easier it gets and I just I think about you know Megan and I, you and I have had the opportunity to work together um, recently on a couple of different things and just having another person in the room like when you're the only how much energy it takes and how you don't feel like you can fail and you feel like you have to be so purposeful about everything and then you add another person in the room and um Ayana and I were talking about, you know, we, we were on a leadership team together before where it was two. And there's something about like the power of three. You get to three and then all of a sudden you're not the only voice in the room. You're not the person who's just amplifying, like constantly amplifying what the other person is doing. But then it's about people start to go, huh, maybe there's something to what they said. And so when I when I look at all of your faces and I think about all of the people that we've said, hey, maybe we can bring this person in the podcast. Like the more I'm starting to see people who you know, are part of our business resource groups growing into leadership positions or we're diversifying like who's at the table for decision making. I'm just excited about like what organic changes are going to happen where we're saying like, hey, like Megan, I love that you speak with authority. I appreciate that so much. How can I learn from you on that? And then people will go, oh yeah, that's a positive thing. That's something that we like so that you don't have to experience this idea of like, oh, I have to you know, lower my voice or make sure that I don't laugh with my whole body when I'm in this room. But we start to build kind of this culture of appreciation for the differences and uniqueness that we bring to the room. And then that leads into how we throw our work and like the diversity of work and our services that we like pull out to everybody else. And so to me, like what excites me is just, I'm, I feel like like I like knock on wood, I'm starting to see those small changes just by nature of the fact that there's different voices in the room in those positions of power and like what's going to happen five to 10 years just because all these folks are here right now. I love that. I love that. I'm a hundred percent. Makia. Yes, thank you. Um, everything you said, Makayla, and and I am looking forward to to no longer being um, an anomaly, right? Like the women who are on this, um, who are here today on this podcast, have been the epitome of speaking your name in rooms that you have not yet entered. 
I could not tell you how many times I've gotten an email or a phone call or a, a pull to the side because somebody told me about you and, and, and they think you would be good for this, right? And so I'm excited about the point where we can get to where that is the norm. That's just what happens, that we are constantly pulling each other and speaking, you know, others' names and rooms that we haven't gotten to yet, um, broadening that community as we're building and getting to this place where like change is happening. And, and I'm no longer shocked when I get an email from a random person and I'm like, who scrolling down, like who sent this to you? And it's like, oh, okay. Of course, of course you did. No, of course they did. Of course he did or what have you. And then let me share someone with you where we're constantly doing that, that each one teach one that, you know, reaching back and, and pulling each other forward where it's not something that is so rare that it shocks us, that it scares us, that it makes us, you know, kind of wary, like, mm, what should you do that for? What that mean? But that we're like, thank you. And then that's it. Like, not thank you. And let me, you know, figure out a, a way that you did a reason for it, like justifying it. I don't want to have to justify anymore. I don't want it to be so rare or so like, mm, how she get here anymore? It's like, of course, of course. And then we're doing that for each other. Y'all are y'all are hitting it hard right now. Absolutely. Uh, I love that, too. I mean, and, and just let's just say that that right there, it starts so organically, right? Like at the end of the day, it starts organically because we're experiencing each other like that, that we get to be able to boast somebody or make that connection where it's necessary. So I agree because that's definitely a part of it. Megan, go ahead. What, what kind of things are, are on your heart? Well, I would say yes to what all three of you shared. Um, I'm reflecting as, you know, as as we're going through this. And when I would say that allow for more time to reflect, we are too busy. I would I took a, a break. I was on vacation for a week. Um, and I had the opportunity to listen to um um audio book from a book that Trey has mentioned several times in our office. And I never had an opportunity to read it. It's the five dysfunctions of a team and got it free through the library on Libby. Okay. In Washington state, we have this audio book system, Libby. So if you're not in Washington state, you look, but anyway, Libby, um, through the library. So I got it for free. And they also have like a version two, um, operationalizing the five or no, no, overcoming the five dysfunctions of a team. So I'm halfway through that second one. Um, but what, what, taking the week off and listen to the book, I got to reflect, right? I, I got to take time to think about like what's going on in our office, reading this material, reflecting on what I'm listening to and thinking about what am I doing that's contributing to this, this environment and what do I, what can I do to help change and influence the environment, right? Like what are things that I can do that's in my scope of control. Sometimes we're like, oh, the problems are too big. So no, we can't do anything. Everybody can do something. Everybody has a role to play in something. We're talking equity and justice for all. It's so big. I can't do it. You can do something. But if you never stop, if you never push pause, even at night, before I go to bed, I was scrolling through online, looking at stories and laughing. And I'm thinking I'm giving my, my brain a chance to rest. And I'm not. I'm not doing that until I give myself some time at the night to just reflect. And you fade off, I fade off into dreamland till my kids wake me up. Um, so I think one, just take some time to stop and reflect during our day. I know we're busy. Everyone's busy, right? And part of it is because we're not work, working efficiently or effectively. And part of that is because we're not letting ourselves reflect. So we're not picking up on things that we could be doing better. And so I say, you know, there's a couple of things that I have to say. It's um, support your employee, no matter if you're in a leadership role, first line supervisor to leadership supports your employees participating in ERGs and BRGs. Um, we have too many people who are still being prevented because of business need. Stop it. Stop it. It's an hour. It's a three hours a month. Let people participate because this is where they get community. Oftentimes, if you're, if you're, uh, if the people on your team don't look like you, or don't have a similar experience, you can't offer them community. So let them be in community because we have more engaged employees. The data shows, right? I mean, it's the data shows more engaged employees perform better, right? So it's not really, if you're saying it's business, if, they, if, if 
business did that they can't participate, you're really reducing their um, productivity anyway. Um, so that's one thing I would say. Also, no matter what position you, your team member is in, from entry level positions to leadership positions, humanize them. What do I mean by that? Uh, treat them like they have expertise. Treat them like they have something to give. I'm in a position right now where uh, people listen to what I have to say and they actually like value it <laughs> without having to get the amens and the amplification and all that stuff, right? But that wasn't always the case. People are the experts in their work. If the other one's doing it all day, every day, they're the experts and they need to be involved in the things that are impact, that decisions that impact them. So humanize them by valuing what they have to give, by valuing their experience, by appreciating their perspective in decision-making spaces, um, by giving them opportunities to grow so that we can promote from within, by supporting their development, by giving them feedback. If they've got, if there's people who uh, are doing something that's not helpful in the workplace, talk to them about it. Yes, hard conversations are hard, but if you're in a leadership role, you asked for it. Don't take the role if you want to avoid conflict. You have, to, it's your job to support your employees and support their growth. And you don't even have to be the one to do it all the time. Let them go to a BRG meeting, right? Uh, my Kia, I was in a leadership role at Build. My Kia is in a leadership role in Build. And my Kia uh, was a co-lead of a subcommittee group, right? I was a chair. That is professional development experience right there, right? So by allowing people to take on these leadership roles, they can get, these professional uh, development experiences, this career development, I'm trying to get that out of my, change my language, these career development opportunities so that they can be in leadership roles in the future, right? And be our leadership of the future. So that's just a couple of things I wanted to share that they're not hard things to do. Uh, it doesn't necessarily come easy because we have taken on this model that says we're a factor. Everybody has a little space in the factor that does a little portion. And we have to break ourselves from that because we're more than that. And I think that all of us, and, and for staff, humanize your leaders, right? When somebody asks me, Megan, how's your day? And I'm like, oh, thank goodness. Because, and I ask for it, right? So I don't feel bad for me. But at the same time, so much of my day is people taking things from me, taking things from me. And when somebody's like, how are you doing? I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm tired. I'm tired, you know? Now let's move ahead and get our little thing, right? It's cool when somebody recognizes you're a human being. Right. And so um, that's something I think we can all do. But I think that by doing that, we're also uh, advance the culture of belonging that we all want and we all need and we all deserve. Ooh, we fire, fire today. Thank you all for joining us for this episode of When We Belong. So excited to hear y'all's perspectives. And it really does encourage me to let me know we're on the right path, yo. Uh, the ideas that all of you bring and your lived experience um, in state government and outside, just bringing it all to the work you're doing today lets me know we're on the right track, right? I mean, having these discussions is not only an opportunity for us to shine a light on some of the ways that we're ushering in belonging for state government in Washington state, but also how we're just dealing with it as people, right? And so I love that 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 concept there, Megan, of humanizing everyone because we are, we are all people here and we're all figuring out our way, figuring out our purpose, our path, whether we're on it, we're sticking to it, we're growing, whether we're ushering that in for other people so they can find theirs. I think it's so important that we all uh, really have been able to express ourselves uh, um, unconditionally here in this platform and really open up the door for you all to also understand how we're moving about what, when it comes to belonging. Thank you all for watching. Thank you all today for being uh, with us all and with the audience. Y'all stay tuned for the next one because you know we're going to keep this rolling for y'all because this discussion is ever changing. And as we embed other elements of belonging, we want to bring you along the pathway with us. So thanks so much for watching.